So we're totally ad libbing this, aren't we? All right, we're just going to We're going to do Roger, aren't we? Okay. Welcome to Crim City. I'm Mark Murray. I'm Josh Hanrahan. We're going to go down memory lane this week, aren't we? Your memory lane, yeah. It'll be interesting to see whether people want that history stuff. Yeah, at least they get a choice, because normally I don't get a choice when you go into your history. <laughs> Special episode this week, Moz. We're going to talk about Roger Rogerson, a hero cop turned into a, a disgraced killer. And judging by the fact that every day when I walk into work, I see a front page story from the Daily Telegraph from years gone by, complete with a photo of you, him, and another woman. I assume you know Roger Rogerson pretty well. I got to know him pretty well. Long story short, where that front page came from, Roger Rogerson, who became a bit of a legend. Some call him Dirty Harry, but others said, no, he was just dirty. He divided all of New South Wales. And I got to know Roger over a period of time. And then, lo and behold, Roger gets done for killing a young drug dealer, Jamie Gow, only about four or five years ago. But (laughs) what had happened is I had to write a first person piece about the Roger I knew. So I've written this story about Roger Rogerson and how I felt I was hoodwinked. I thought he was a charismatic character that maybe pushed the boundaries of the laws a hundred years ago. Anyway, I wrote this piece after he'd been arrested for this murder, which was a massive story at the time. And they found this fun photo that was in the library that had never been published. And it's a photo of Roger on one side and Kim Hollingsworth laying one on my lips. But at the time, my now wife, we were just going out. We we were not talking basically we were having a little argument and she was getting all these phone calls and there there I was this photograph between a accused killer and Kim Hollingsworth on the front page of the Daily Telegraph it went down really well so anyway that's where the that photo comes from but um yeah the story of Roger the story of Roger so Moz talk to me do you remember the first time you met Roger or the early days of knowing Roger first encounter I had with Roger Rogerson was, I think it was mid-80s, 86 or so. He was still this legend. So I get sent out. He's been involved in a assault, allegedly, when he went to help one of his neighbours. So I got sent out there as a, a fairly young reporter, and I was in the driveway waiting for him to come out. And he has. He's got into his Falcon and he's come at me <laughs> at about 45 miles an hour. He's barreled out of this garage and I've had to jump out of the way. That was my first encounter with Roger. And it wasn't until about 10 years later that I got to meet him. From then, I'd, I'd learned a lot about Roger. Roger, he was tipped to be the next police commissioner. He was considered uh, one of the most daring police officers. He shot three men and killed them while on duty which now people will say were probably executions. He was uh, incredibly intelligent, apparently brilliant in the witness box. He had shorthand of about 140 words a minute. He won the um, Peter Mitchell Police Award, which was given to the most promising detective. He was a hero to many, many police in New South Wales. And it started to unravel around the mid-80s, when he shot a bank robber called Warren Lanfranchi in uh, Dangar Place at Chippendale. Now, that was all supposedly done in the, the line of duty, but there were serious question marks asked about that. And Warren Lanfranchi's girlfriend at the time, Sally Ann Huckstep, came from a very well-to-do eastern suburbs family, but fallen into the, the bad life, fell in love with Warren Lanfranchi and started making noises saying, he was executed, that Rogerson killed him. And that's when this publicity started to unravel on Roger, that he was a corrupt cop. Around that time, as you said, obviously he was regarded as arguably the best detective in the force, but on the side he was also knocking around with some blokes who who were no good. Arthur Nettie Smith? Yeah, just uh, (laughs) when when we discuss blokes who were no good in New South Wales, where would you put him? Arthur Nettie Smith is probably one of the most evil men that had walked this city. He was very, very big in the heroin trade. He also was a rapist and a killer, you know, and Roger and he started palling around. Roger said he was an informant. 
they used to drink in, in all these pubs in Sydney and like quite openly, Roger, you know. He was so confident that no one could lay a glove on him that he would be seen drinking with one of Sydney's most notorious criminals. And that was part of his charisma, was his confidence. And from that, he went from strength to strength. You know, he had fantastic lockup rate for armed holdups, mainly because he was getting information from all the other crooks who were giving up all their mates. And then you dig down deeper. Roger supposedly had given Nettie Smith, who was also a very, very good armed robber in the day, the infamous green light which means he would be able to say, right, I'm going to knock this bank or I'm going to do this payroll armoured van. The cops would all know and Roger would make sure that there were no cops around to stop it. So That's the kind of power that Roger had back in those days, wasn't yeah. it? That he could literally, if Nettie Smith wanted to do a job, rob a bank, he could make sure all the cops were looking the other way and he would be on the take yeah. from Nettie. Yeah. Yeah. Half the cops were in fear of him and the other half were in awe of him. Mm. And you've got to remember, he's only a detective sergeant. Mm. He's never a superintendent or anything like that. He was a street-level cop. And I think he liked that because he could control the streets. And he ran this city. He really did. And I didn't know him back then when he was running. I got to know him later. I went along to Bankstown Sports Club. He was doing a fundraiser for himself, which he was very fond of doing those fundraisers for Roger. (laughs) Um, And I had a copy of a book because... At the time, in the mid-80s, again, what helped Roger's downfall was an undercover cop by the name of Mick Drury was shot at his home in Chatswood. Now, Mick Drury, as he's got two bullets in his chest, you know, basically they don't think he's going to make it. He's been given his last rights. He's in hospital. He makes his dying declaration that just before he was shot, Roger Rogerson had offered him $30,000 to run dead as a witness in a undercover drug bust in Melbourne that Mick Drury was part of, and he'd said no. So Roger was actually charged with conspiracy to murder Mick Drury, an undercover cop, and again, that divided the police force. By the mid-'90s, you know, Roger had beaten that charge, but it still lingered that Roger was up to his neck in it. But a book had come out called In the Line of Fire, which Mick Drury had helped write. And Mick Drury I'd got to know quite well and became mates with. So I went along to the Bankstown Sports Club and I went up to him and uh, I'd had already had this book signed by Mick Drury. I said, you know, mate, I'm Mark Murray from uh, the Daily Telegraph. Can you sign this book? I said, it's actually been signed by Mick Drury. And he just gave me a bit of a look. And then he wrote, don't believe anything in this book. Signed Roger Rogerson. And then uh, I didn't have much to do with him for a while. And then um, the Underbelly series hit and the editor at the time said, do you reckon we could get Roger Rogerson to review each day and answer questions on each part of this Underbelly about King's Cross? And so I hunted Roger down all by looking him up in the phone book. And I said, I got his number again. And I said, remember me? And he said, oh, yeah, I remember you're smart ass. I said, mate, can we have a few beers and we'll talk about this thing? So we started doing this blog. And the payment was we'd go over to the Aurora or the Evening Star and I'd pay for as many drinks as he could have that night and then put him in a cab. And Roger and I established a relationship from there. I'd meet him quite often and we'd get on the drink and he'd tell me stories. Like I went to school with a guy and I was 10 called um, Alan Bradley, and his sister was abducted. She was 14, found sliced, raped, and murdered up at um, up at Barara, Cowan, around there. And it's funny, I'm having a beer with Roger <laughs> over at the Aurora, and we're just talking about things, and he said, you know, one of the best pieces of police work I ever did. I said, what? And he said, I locked up that fucking mongrel that killed that schoolgirl a bit, bit before your time, Sonny. I said, who was that? He said, Maureen Bradley. And I went, no. Nah. I remember going to um, going to church and praying for her with all of our uh, class. And there is Roger. He was really proud. Like, he did lock up. He did some good police work. Yeah. In between. The dodges. Very hor- the dark side, <laughs> you know. I remember another crime reporter who I won't name, Yoni Bashan, who <laughs> said to me, oh, mate, he's so yesterday. He's not relevant. I'm telling you what, Roger's even 90s, the 2000s, he knew everything was going on in this city. He was so connected. Well, it's interesting that you two were 
so friendly and got on so well because I know he wasn't fond of, of all journos. I, I know of one that was writing something about Roger and then got a call the next morning at Holt Street here and... Come down to the foyer, please. There's someone here to see you. And there's Roger Rogerson. And he says, don't you ever write anything like that again, son. Yeah. It would have been pretty intimidating. Very intimidating. Didn't mince his words. And I don't know exactly what had been proven at that point, but there was obviously a lot of rumour around about the things that he'd been heavily involved in, obviously, including getting another cop shot, allegedly. That was a bit of a dilemma for me in a way because I'd actually got to know Mick Drury very, very well. And there I am quite often going to lunches with Mick Drury and other cops and drug squad cops and everything. And then at the same time catching up with Roger Rogerson, who's accused of trying to kill him. And Mick Drury was very understanding. He said, I know you've got to do it. He said, but be careful with this guy. And I justified it in my own mind that the reason that Mick Drury was shot by the Melbourne underworld and Roger couldn't control him. He tried to get that 30000 to Drury and Drury had said no and that Roger had no part in it. That's how I justified it in my mind. Years later, I know how wrong I was. But around the time Roger got arrested, about 2015 or so, for the shooting of the young drug dealer, Jamie Gow, it kind of saved me a bit of a dilemma because I was going to be married. And Mick Drury, he was on the invitation list. And I remember, you know, Roger saying, oh, mate, you're going to get married soon. And I'm going, yeah. I'm thinking, there's no way I can have Roger and Mick at my wedding. So luckily he got banged up before that. Let's talk about Jamie Gow, young kid involved in that drug game, meets up with Roger and Glenn Glenn McNamara. There's the great CCTV footage of the three of them walking into a storage unit. I don't know where it was. Padstow? Padstow. Yeah, so three of them walk in and two of them walk out. Yeah. Jamie Gow was a young guy with big dreams of being a major drug dealer and synced up with Glenn McNamara, who was a former King's Cross police officer as well. He and Jamie were like go-betweens. And it's funny, about three weeks before the actual murder, I was having a beer with Roger and he said, oh, you've got to meet this bloke, Glenn McNamara. I'm doing a bit of work with him, you know, a bit of private eye stuff, you know, we're doing a bit of stuff. I went, yeah, but I never did. Anyway... Jamie Gow was working with the Triads. The biggest Asian crime group in the world. So he was working with them and McNamara to do a whole lot of um, basically methamphetamine to do a big deal. But he had also been interviewed by the Australian Crime Commission, which is a very powerful law enforcement body. Yeah, their greatest power is that they can compel you to answer questions. They already know the answers, but they want to hear it straight out of your mouth. And that was kind of known. So... Whether that's why he was killed or whether it's just a straight drug grip. You know, Jamie Gow had been shooting off his mouth to all his mates saying, I'm onto something big. You know, he's a 20-year-old kid. And he thought he'd made this connection with this former cop who had a connection with another former famous cop. You know, streets are paved with drug money, you know. So he's dropped off by two guys at this storage facility where he, he meets Roger and Glenn McNamara. And as you said, Three go in and only Roger and McNamara come out. There's a third thing that comes out. No, that's there? right. Then yeah. they're carrying a surfboard case which has the body of Jamie Gow in it. But I do remember on the on the Sunday I was working and there was a guy from Robbery and Serious Crime, a guy called um, Luke Moore, doing this press conference over a missing person, Jamie Gow. I go, wow, this is a bit unusual. So I went along to the press conference. It was obviously a big deal to have... This detective, his rank, giving a press conference on a Sunday. And I've rung Luke up after the press conference and I said, mate, what did they drag you out for this on a Sunday? And he was very evasive. He said, oh, mate, no, no. Yeah, we would expect a result on this. I'm going, okay. I said, yeah, but it just seems a bit weird. He said, oh, mate, it'll all become apparent. Don't worry. I went home and I get a phone call at eight o'clock from Miranda Devine, reporter on The Telegraph at the time. She said, there's this wild rumour that they're hunting Roger Rogerson for murder. I go, what the fuck? Roger? Roger at this stage, Roger's 73, walks with a limp. She said, I don't know. I don't know anything. It's just this wild rumour. I'm going, okay. 
and Ben English, who was acting editor, he's rung me up and he said, what about Rogers? And I said, oh, mate, this is a load of shit. Anyway, to humour me, I started ringing around. I rang ahead of Homicide, I forget who it was, who didn't answer. And then I rang up another guy and I said, what about Rogerson being wanted for murder? And he went, how'd you find that out? I go, wow, there's something to this. Anyway, I kept hitting the phones and eventually somebody just spilled and just said, yep, you know that guy earlier today? They think he's killed him, but we can't find Roger. He's done a runner. And I just couldn't believe this. And Roger had actually jumped in his car was up in Queensland driving up there, which he did frequently. He used to do these shows where he'd go around talking about, you know, New South Wales police force was the best money could buy when he worked for him. He used to love that line. So we came out the next day, wanted for murder, Roger Rogerson, and I still to this day, I didn't believe it. You know, and then I started seeing all the evidence, then you realised he was up to his neck in killing this young guy. That's great journalism. Yeah, yeah. By Miranda Devine. By Miranda That's right. <laughs> yeah, it was by Miranda Devine, yeah. I did try to ring Roger that Sunday night to see whether he... No, he, he, he wasn't answering. <laughs> he never answered that phone ever again. <laughs> um, I didn't believe it. But also I think probably having the relationship with him that you had would have made you not want to believe it. Yeah. I probably had a beer with him a week beforehand. Although there was one time... We'd had a fair few beers and we're on the balcony at the Aurora Hotel here in Surrey Hills. And I asked him about Mick Drury and I said, now, what really happened with Mick? And fuck, (laughs) he looked at me and I fucking, I've never been so scared in my life until the next time he looked at me (laughs) in court about six years later. That scared the shit out of me. But anyway, from there it became the Rogerson Circus. Yeah. So Jamie Gow's body washed up down at Cronulla? About Two, three days after Roger's arrested, up pops this body in in a blue tarp with the surfboard thing. Because bodies float. Well, yeah. See, this is the thing with Roger, when you check into his history, and I did eventually, and Roger knows a lot about murder, but Roger was king of the town. Roger didn't get rid of bodies. There were shit kickers to do that. And, you know, the smart guys, one, you don't just weight them down, you (laughs) As brutal as it sounds, they get gases. So the smart guys, apparently, they perforate their stomachs and stuff like that. Puncture wounds. Puncture them. And um, Roger and Glenn didn't do that. And the body popped up, and that just was icing on the cake because here you have the body in that cover, which matches the CCTV footage at the storage unit. You know, And that was the other thing, is the, the disbelief amongst the police force that Roger could be caught and why would he be doing this? I think it was relevance. I just think he wanted to be a big player still. He didn't take it well once he was charged. Not that that's a surprise, you know, considering no, the he, kind of bloke he was that, you know, he, yeah. he'd run the town, he'd gotten away with so much before, he probably assumed yeah. he'd get away with this. But up until what, last year, he's continued to fight it. Oh, and yeah. that's And so he, this is all in 2014, the Jamie Gow incident. So that's the best part of eight years that he's fought this Four. through the courts and- with a a heap of evidence against him. Yeah, and there's no way it can be a mistake because <laughs> that storage facility, there was plastic laid out yeah. so they could wrap him up. And the other thing is when you see that CCTV footage, Roger has this very distinct gait. And so, I mean, Luke Moore, the cop I was telling you about, when they've seen that CCTV footage, they've just gone, shit, fuck, that's Roger Rogerson. The, the other question everyone asks is, you know, because McNamara says, Roger did it. He was scared of Roger. Roger says, McNamara did it. I didn't know he was going to do it. I was just there to help, blah, blah, blah. No doubt in my mind, Roger would have gone in and gone, bang, 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 come on, let's go. And then you do. You see, an hour later, they've got a six-pack of beer on their way to going to get disposed of the body. And that is just Roger. So what happened after that, when he'd been charged with murder, and it was obvious he was going to go down. The editor at the time, Chris Dorr, came up to me and he said, mate, I want you to spend the next six months looking into Rogerson, which I did. And then from that, it made me feel even dumber <laughs> because, you know, this guy that I thought was a dirty Harry, he was just fucking evil. What did you find? I found that he probably was behind the disappearance of Lynn Woodward. She was a flatmate of Sally-Ann Huckstep, 
whose boyfriend, Warren Lanfranchi, was killed by Rogerson. And at the inquest, she had stood up and said, I know of corrupt police that are involved and I have tapes. But the inquest was adjourned. Linda Woodward, she walked out of the coroner's court, never to be seen again. And I have now a very good authority from a number of people that she got into a car with Roger Rogerson and Nettie Smith. Her body's never been found. And then I found he was arrested for conspiring to deal drugs with a guy called Dennis Allen, Dr. Death from Victoria in 1980. Right? I found four paragraphs. And I go, what the fuck? 1980, this is the height of his power. And what happened to that? I can't find any court documents. It's just vanished. And he still ended up being a serving police officer. Another story where a coroner walked into the coroner's office at 7.30 in the morning, and there is Roger going through files, just taking what he wants. And that's when I found out that he, he wasn't just Dirty Harry or a bit roguish. He was just a thief and a killer. And I was talking to another cop who, who knew Roger really well, liked him. We used to drink together. And this is after Roger had been done. He goes, fuck. He said, now actually legally, he's a serial killer with a badge. And that was what we did a 16-page wraparound with and called him serial killer with a badge, which he didn't like. How did he take it the next time you saw him? Well, I'd never written a bad story about Roger, ever. And I thought Roger would be that pragmatic that once he was found guilty, knew he was fucked, he would understand that I had to do what I did. So I went along to the sentencing. You know, I was a little bit apprehensive, you know. This 16-page wraparound had come out, and I hadn't heard anything. Anyway, I go in the court, Roger's come up, and I've looked at him and nodded, thinking Roger would just go, oh, he just went ballistic. Fuck, he stood up. He went red in his mouth. Fucking profanities. He's got his hand like a gun. And I've got to admit, even I think one of the reporters next to me said, you okay? And I, I was shaken. I mean, it doesn't take, I mean, you're a 74-year-old man in custody for life. I'm still scared of him. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, there was a book written about Roger called The Dark Side, saying that Roger was taken to the dark side by his involvement with Nettie Smith and that he kind of seduced Roger into the dark life. And that's a load of crap. Roger was born on the dark side. I think he joined the police force and he saw it as his chance to run Sydney. To actually get that close to evil and be hoodwinked by it is not a nice feeling. But as I said, the support I got from coppers afterwards was quite nice, saying, don't feel so stupid, but I still do. And now Roger will die in jail. Hopefully. <laughs> yes, he will. He's lost all his appeals. He's, he's over 80 now. And they were sentenced to life in prison. Yeah. And they've put him in uh, basically a dementia ward at Long Bay. Well, now, Roger, you go along and have a couple of beers with Roger, and the next thing you know, there are people wanting to be around him. It's like... It was not like going with a rock star, but, you know, you go anywhere around Surrey Hills, everybody knows Roger, wants to talk to Roger, and Roger loves telling a tale. So he's there with these guys whose minds are mush. The fact that he won't be able to have intelligent conversation will hurt him. Quite a fitting way for him to spend his days. Yeah. We'll never have another Roger Rogerson, though. The blind eye, the green light, that's all over. New South Wales police won't allow it. And I don't think society would allow it. Thanks for listening to Trim City. I'm Mark Murray. I'm Josh Hanrahan. This episode's been produced and edited by Jasper Leek. And executive producer Dan Box. If you're a Crimex Plus subscriber, I hope you're enjoying your early and ad-free access to this podcast. We've got a bunch of other great new series. One to look out for at the moment is The Missing. Listen early and ad-free at CrimeX or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, you can see us weekly on TikTok. To learn more, visit dailytelegraph.com.au. 